callers will be placed in listen-only mode. And following management's prepared remarks, the conference call will be open for your questions. This conference call is being recorded. This call may include forward-looking statements and projections, which do not guarantee future events or performance. Please refer to Apollo's most recent SEC filings for risk factors related to these statements. Apollo will be discussing certain non-GAAP measures on this call, which management believes are relevant in assessing the financial performance of the business. These non-GAAP measures are reconciled to GAAP figures in Apollo's earnings presentation, which is available on the company's website. Also note that nothing on this call constitutes an offer to sell or a solicitation of an offer to purchase any interest in any Apollo fund. I would now like to turn the call over to Peter Minster, Head of Investor Relations. Thanks, Operator. Welcome to our first quarter 2021 earnings call. Joining me this morning are Mark Rowland, CEO and co-founder, Scott Simon, co-president, and Martin Kelly, CFO and co-COO. I'd like to turn it over to Mark to kick off our comments for today. Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you, Peter, uh, and welcome all. Uh, Q121 was a strong quarter for Apollo. Uh, record FRE of $287 million, or $0.65 cents a share, up 26% year-over-year, up 4% sequentially. Total inflows of $13 billion, uh, me, uh, up fund, driven by $5 billion of fundraising and $4 billion of Athene Organic. All right. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Live Valuation. Today, we're going to be covering Apollo Global Management, Asset Management Group. Give me a second to everything's in the right places and we'll get started. Okay. I believe we are good to go. So Apollo is a pretty decently large asset management group and uh, private equity company. They uh, manage a whole lot of assets, about $461 billion in asset center management as of the last quarter. Uh, the, oh, the, global, the management company that is essentially the main corporate entity that manages it all uh, definitely has a, a pretty small uh, revenue and income relative to the assets under management that are under the fund that it controls. Uh, so that kind of makes it a little bit of a strange company to look at because you're not going to find the $461 billion of assets on their balance sheet. It, so, for example, you can see right here that the, the revenue base is in the few billion kind of range, uh, which has a very, very strange way of looking at it because it's positive and negative due to uh, changes in the, the uh, realizable value as per the most recent accounting measures that they uh, have companies operate under from about a year or two ago or a few years ago when now you have to account for the, the differences in investment, uh, investment value in, as per the market mark to market as they call it. So that kind of creates a little bit of a discrepancy in the numbers that is a little bit strange, but we're gonna do our best to break through it uh, in the quarterly and annual reports as we put it into the spreadsheet. 
They pay out a pretty decent amount of dividends to shareholders as basically the way to return capital. Uh, as I said, it's not just the uh, investment portfolio that they operate, but also a pretty significant real estate portfolio and private equity uh, grouping. They do a lot of investments in distressed debt and uh, otherwise other, other private companies as well, uh, which gives a pretty good diversification base for their investors, which is you know one of the reasons to have uh, money managed by such a, a large global asset management group as opposed to just putting it in a mutual fund or uh, an ETF. So as you can see here, here's kind of like a distribution of those assets and what they are made up of. A uh, very significant amount of credit, uh, a pretty significant amount of private equity, and then also a decent amount of real assets. So, which they're, uh, Claiming a 20 to 22% cogger in assets under management, depending on how you measure the, the assets, uh, which isn't to say that their uh, return has been in the 20 to 22% range. It's just the total assets that they manage, but showing more just the scope, the scope of their uh, growth of, of scale, not necessarily the, uh, the growth of their returns. And then here, the, the change in their performance fees under the management is more like an actual measurement of their returns, I guess you could say. Or not really their actual returns, but the returns to the shareholder as a, as a result of the management of those assets. So we'll get into the, the most recent earnings release a little bit further later. We're really just going to hop straight into uh, kind of break down numbers. And I'm just going to play the, the annual the, the quarterly call. AUM of $461 billion, up $145 billion year over year, 46% year over year, and 6%, 6 billion quarter over quarter. Reflecting $13 billion of inflows, $9 billion of positive marks on the PE portfolio, partially offset by reductions uh, in the yield portfolios at Athena and Athora due to rising rates and changing position of the euro. Our opportunistic businesses had a particularly strong quarter as they are positioned for a strong US and European recovery. The PE portfolio in particular was up 22% versus an S&P of 5.8%. Scott, I know, will take you through more details, including deployment and realization, and Martin will take you through the financials. As I discussed on our last earnings call, I had some simple observations on our business and by extension our, our strategy. We are in our growth business. This quarter and the year over year results make this abundantly clear. We provide a product that is in high demand. We provide excess returns to investors on a risk adjusted basis. We serve a growing market driven primarily by the need for retirement income. We serve this market directly through our Athene and Athora affiliates, and indirectly through our institutional clients, our pension funds, retirement systems, sovereign wealth funds, and others. The demographics and market trends of our market, aging, indexation, low rates, need for retirement income, mean that in general, the business gets better every day. We recognize how fortunate we are to be in a growth business. If you dig down to the next level, if you look at our largest business, our yield business, which is more than 330 billion of our AUM, that business is not limited in its growth by capital or liabilities. It is limited in its growth by assets. And that limitation is only temporary. It is our job and therefore our strategy to expand our capacity to generate assets that provide interesting risk reward for this segment of the market. In our hybrid and opportunistic businesses, it is a little bit more balanced. Some of our strategies still, still have substantial room to expand by expanding their access to capital because the front end of those businesses is just so, so strong. Apollo's unique value proposition is that we are exceptionally good at generating excess returns across a very broad swath 
of the risk return spectrum from investment grade to private equity. Examples of excess return across this very broad spectrum, not over one year, but over a very long period of time, I think are instructive. In private equity, our 31-year return is 39% gross, 24 net, with every core private equity fund having generated carry. An incredible track record, which puts us substantially ahead of the top quartile PE performance. It's not any one fund. It's not size of funds. It's not any one investment cycle. It is the discipline of the franchise and what we do. And I know Scott will spend time walking you through the returns of the most recent funds and how we approach our opportunistic businesses. In our yield business, I believe the best example of our capacity to generate excess return is manifested by examining our largest client, Athene. If you look at Athene since inception over more than the past decade, their ROE in their insurance businesses is 22% and on a consolidated basis, 15% on average over this period of time. This is substantially in excess of any comparable company or comparable index. In the context of this background, this quarter was all about reinforcing strategy, building our front end for capacity to generate additional assets, and positioning us to grow faster. The biggest step in the quarter was obviously our decision to enter into an agreement to merge with Athene. This transaction massively reinforces our position serving retirement income and retirees, adding almost a million clients, including our pension retirement transfer business, an average age in the high 60s. This transaction adds to our capacity and coordination to develop additional yield platforms through aligning Apollo and Athene. Thinking back to what we have been able to achieve with us not fully aligned, whether it is our mid-cap corporate credit business, our triple net lease business, our aircraft finance business, our Reading Ridge structured products business, the list goes on and on. I'm excited as to what we can achieve with full alignment. In our hybrid and opportunistic businesses, this transaction increases our ability to see products and to see teams and to launch new funds and simply to get to market faster. Some examples of what we've done historically include our hybrid value fund, our infrastructure fund, and numerous others. The transaction also represents a significant strengthening of our connection to additional forms of distribution, including retail, banks, independent broker-dealers, and other wealth channels. These wealth distribution channels represent a significant source of growth for us, and we expect 2021, even prior to the closing of the transaction with Athene, to be a record year for Apollo in these channels and a source of significant future growth. The merger was not the only step we took in the quarter to reinforce our strategy. Significant progress was made in our high-grade alpha business. Apollo has developed a unique platform to provide capital and funding to large corporations globally in the investment-grade market. Our unconstrained appetite for long-dated, creative, and semi-liquid solutions have allowed us to execute multi-billion dollar transactions in a short time frame as a sole counterparty to these corporations. Working with our partners, with our 400 plus investment professionals, we expect to generate 15 to 20 billion of these transactions in 2021. Also in the quarter, we announced the launch of our credit secondary system, a new platform levering our insurance affiliates' appetite for this asset class into a very fast growing private credit secondary market. This is one of the first funds in this rapidly growing space, and we plan to raise substantial additional money in the future for this strategy as we continue to build out our general partnership solutions capabilities. In summary, this is an investment year. We're focused on setting the business up so that it grows faster over the next five years, and Scott will take you through some of the investments we're making during 2021 in his prepared remarks. Away from the financials of the business and the strategy of the business, we delivered the changes in governance that we had set out in, our first, in the first conference call I had done with you. We began to implement changes to our governance to establish a simpler, more transparent corporate structure 
we believe ultimately positions us to be eligible for S&P index inclusion. In closing, the business is firing on all cylinders. We're making tremendous progress, and I'm very optimistic about growth. I want to take this moment to thank over 1,700 Apollo employees around the world, including 59 new hires in Q1 who worked tirelessly to achieve the results we have announced today. Culturally, the senior management team is focused on positioning the firm to speak authentically about what we can achieve and what we can particularly have an impact on. We are very focused on expanding opportunity, particularly for broader segments of society that heretofore may not have had access to the same opportunities. We can do this at Apollo. We can also do this through our portfolio companies. More to come on this in the near future. Our efforts around citizenship, diversity, equity, inclusion, and ESG are core to our value proposition for our people. And we continue to raise awareness and deepen education on the key issues. In January, we received a score of 100% from the Human Rights Campaign Foundation with regard to being the best place to work for LGBTQ equality. Yesterday, we announced a significant donation to United Way India's Partner Act to immediately deploy thousands of oxygen concentrations and other critical life-saving medical equipment to those in most need. Our hearts go out to the Apollo community in India and their loved ones who are experiencing the impact of this crisis. With that, I will now turn it over to Scott. Thanks, Mark, and thank you all for joining us this morning. As Mark mentioned, Apollo differentiates itself by the ability to generate excess returns across the entire risk-reward spectrum. In this quarter, we again demonstrated the strength of this proposition across our platform. When I think about the overall performance of the business, I break it down into five key factors. Finding good investments to deploy capital, having the portfolio accrete in value, monetizing our investments, raising more capital, and investing in and growing both our existing platforms as well as our new ones. So far in 2021, Apollo has made very good progress across all of these areas. So let me get through them one by one. Regarding deployment, our ability to find attractive returns at all points along the risk spectrum shines in an environment like the one we're in now, where valuations are seemingly high for private equity and yields are painfully thin for most credit products. Total deployment for Q1 was $24.9 billion. Our private equity funds deployed $2.4 billion in capital in the quarter. Additionally, we committed to deploy a further $3.3 billion in the quarter, <clears throat> driven by two large Fund 9 investments. Michaels and the Venetian. And since quarter end, we've continued to commit to significant additional transactions. We continue to see a strong recovery in the economy, particularly in those sectors hardest hit by COVID, such as leisure, travel, gaming, and specialty retail. And we continue to invest in those spaces. Our hybrid value business continues to be active with over half a billion dollars deployed in the quarter. Strong deployment of $19.1 billion in our credit business in the first quarter was in line with fourth quarter levels and includes strong insurance balance sheet growth on insurance inflows and pension risk transfer transactions. With spreads tight, others are going down in quality to earn returns, but we've been moving up in credit quality and finding our returns through superior asset selection and origination. This will set us up well in the future. We're preparing for, but not predicting, higher rates to come. Our initiative to seek increased high-grade alpha origination transactions continues to grow and has a robust pipeline. We continue to see substantial opportunities to provide capital and funding solutions to corporations and financial institutions globally with the ability and expertise to find innovative solutions and structures. Also, we are now fully in the European direct loan market, committing to $1 billion in the first quarter. This is a space we weren't present a year ago. And lastly, JCPenney has agreed to transfer $2.8 billion in pension obligations for roughly 30,000 participants in JCPenney's pension plan to Athene as part of a pension transfer transaction. Athene utilized its strategic cap capital vehicle, ACRA, to support the completion of this transaction. In terms of value creation, this has been an exceptional quarter for Apollo. Mark just mentioned our very strong track record in private equity for over 31 years. 
we continue to show that we have an ability to find attractive returns in any market environment. We continue to believe that purchase price matters, and we will utilize our expertise to creatively source, structure, and optimize assets, add va adding value in partnership with our growing in-house operations team of experts. This can clearly be seen in our most recent and largest fund, Fund 9. We're seeing very strong performance in this fund, with the current marks up 33% leading to an IRR of 49% gross, 26% net, and a MOEC of 1.7 times. While we expect these numbers to converge over time towards historic levels, we see the results as a validation of our investment expertise and of the fact that this continues to be a very high return business if done the right way. In a market characterized by indexation, correlation, and volatility, Apollo's investment discipline really stands out. During the quarter, our overall private equity segment appreciated by 22% as compared to the S&P at 5.8%, driven by exceptionally strong performance across our funds, public and private holdings. Fund 8 and Fund 9 appreciated by 19% and 33% respectively, driving an increase in the net carry assets at $3.04 per share, up from $1.82 per share in the fourth quarter. Importantly, Fund 8 returned to paying cash carry and the netting hole of the fund has been eliminated. Fund 8 is now marked at a multiple of invested capital of 1.8 times, and we expect it to continue to grow and create value as the portfolio matures. As a reminder, Fund 9 crossed into carry in the fourth quarter of last year, and as of the first quarter, it is in full carry. Our hybrid value fund is delivering strong performance with gross IRR of 31%, 25% net, and MOAC of 1.3 times. We also experienced strong performance with our infrastructure equity fund in the quarter, up 15%. In credit, our fund's aggregate portfolio returned 4% during the quarter, 1.9% above the benchmark. Notably, our global corporate credit business generated a 3% total return in the quarter, reflecting over 80 basis points of outperformance to its benchmark. In addition, the performance of structured credit exceeded the index by approximately 400 basis points for the quarter, and our credit strategy fund generated 5% in the quarter, 150 basis points above its index. Our strong credit performance has been driven in part by the excess spread we've been able to generate for our insurance and other clients, which stems from our differentiated and expanding origination capabilities. Regarding realization, we saw strong monetization of our investment, with $3.7 billion of capital returned to LPs in the first quarter. The total capital returned to LPs over the last 12 months adds to $10.4 billion. We announced several large transactions this quarter, including the highly successful IPO of Sun Country, a Fund 8 portfolio company, the merger of Tech Data, a Fund 9 portfolio company with Synax, the sale of Amerihome, owned by Athene and several Apollo funds, to Western Alliance, and NGL Energy Partners through our yield business. We have a strong pipeline and expect to continue generating strong monetization for our investors. On fundraising, this quarter, we raised a significant amount of capital from third-party investors, near the high end of the $15 to $20 billion annual range we have discussed in the past. All in all, we've made great progress with our investors over the quarter, and for the most part, they have been incredibly supportive of all the recent changes at Apollo. We have several funds raising capital in the market now, and closed on $4.8 billion in the quarter. In addition, we saw inflows of $4.2 billion from our insurance affiliates, with total inflows for the quarter of $13.4 billion. We also see a huge opportunity to expand our distribution in the wealth management channel and are building now the capability to do that. We are confident in our fundraising targets for the year and have already raised over $2 billion since quarter end. Lastly, with respect to investing in our platform and growth, to echo Mark's comments, we see incredible opportunities to accelerate growth and are investing in the business. It is an exciting time to be in the asset management business. Capital flows are concentrating towards a select few players who can provide the breadth of products and services that investors are looking for. And that trend is only accelerating and creating new winners and losers. We see an enormous opportunity ahead of us, and we're planting the right seeds to take advantage of many of these growth opportunities. We're adding over 400 employees this year across all parts of our business. We're growing our core product teams and building capabilities to scale our platform and increase our ability to generate excess returns across several areas, including infrastructure, impact investing, credit and GP secondaries, direct origination, capital markets and syndication, 
and SPACs, just to name a few. As we build these growth engines, we're also continuing to build the enterprise solutions teams to support this growth. We're confident, confident that this type of investment will produce at least mid-teens growth in FRE over the long term, with some fluctuations between low teens and high teens depending on investment opportunities in any given year. We believe the path forward is bright for Apollo, and we're excited to continue on this strong trajectory. I speak for the entire management team in expressing our gratitude for our deep bench of talent who've come together to drive the success that we've experienced so far this year. So with that, I'll turn it over to Martin. Great. <clears throat> Thanks, Scott. For the first quarter, Apollo recorded exceptional results across all relevant financial and operating metrics. Our gap net income to common shareholders was $670 million, or $2.81 per share in the first quarter, as compared with $0.44 cents per share for the full year 2020 and $3.71 per share for the full year 2019. We generated record FRE of $0.65 cents per share on a pre-tax basis, up 26% year-over-year and 4% quarter-over-quarter, driven by growth in management fees and an uptick in FRE performance fees related to our COO manager. Management fees grew 3% over the prior quarter and 17% over the first quarter of 2020, driven by growth in fees for investing the assets of our insurance clients and deployment across our, our platform broadly. Transaction and advisory fees were $56 million in the quarter, driven by capital solutions transactions and private equity activity. I'm seeing a so geographic a more normalized level than in uh, distribution quarters, information. Pre-2020 quarterly average. Up I know they only operate out of the U.S. and Europe. It's more representative of the run rate we expect but. as our origination business further scales. Compensation expense was That's where the private equity and the real assets are, but they could very possibly be taking clients from other locations. The growth initiatives that Scott outlined. So I can't just use the U.S. and Europe as some as some sort of uh, hand in for the geographic information. Time items. Might just put global reminder, equity risk premium in. Comp was elevated due to costs related to the independent review. For the first quarter, we announced a dividend of 50 cents per share yeah. and after tax distributable earnings of 66 cents per share, supported by, by both our strong pre tax FRE and net. Do they have something else in the. After tax distributable earnings okay, but $94 million were up 78% over the first quarter of 2020 and reflect the return of fund aid to paying cash carry. Turning to AUM, we ended the first quarter at $461 billion, up $6 billion quarter over quarter, and $146 billion year over year. Inflows total $13 billion for the quarter, reflecting robust fundraising of $5 billion for numerous strategies across the platform, organic growth at Athene, and growth in our CLO platform. The third party capital raised in the quarter is an indication that our relationships with LPs remain strong, and we expect the majority of capital raise headwinds to now be behind us. For the first quarter, fee generating AUM fell nominally due to interest rate driven markdowns on Athene and Othello's balance sheets. However, fee generating AUM grew 43% year over year, supported by continued inflows and capital deployment. The impact on management fees of the markdowns of these balance sheets is largely reflected in the first quarter numbers and re represents approximately 1% of management fees on an annualized run rate basis. While higher rates do reduce management fees on Athene's existing assets, we believe that higher rates are a net positive for Athene and Apollo, given increased origination volumes and an, and an ability to earn five, higher income on deployment into new assets. Turning to incentive realizations, we recognized $107 million of gross performance fees for the first quarter, primarily related to monetization, monetization activity and fund aid, and our hybrid value fund in our private equity business. As Scott mentioned, the impairment Yeah, I think I'm just going to use the global equity risk premium because this is uh, driven principally by secondary transactions of one main not giving us any sort of geographic information. capital of 1.8 and a current gross and net IRR of 576 or something. The callback obligations of 17 cents per share that we report in our earnings release are related to older legacy funds including fund 5 and some older credit funds 
and are specific to those funds and not cross collateralized across other funds. We do not expect these clawback amounts, if materialized, to become cash obligations for at least several years from now. Deployment in our drawdown funds was $2.7 billion in the first quarter, and our pipeline across the platform remains robust as we have significant equity commitments on announced transactions in our platform. Uh, which reminds me. Our broader measure of deployment, which reflects the breadth Let's of see our if there's updated, uh, was again strong at $25 earnings forecast. Deployment was driven by strong growth in nope. insurance clients, including repositioning the assets acquired from Jackson, investments in our syndicated loans business, as well as middle market and commercial real estate lending activity. Our dry powder for investments across our fund complex was $50 billion at the end of the quarter, of which $24 billion has the potential to drive management fees upon investment. Apollo remains in a very strong liquidity position with approximately $1.7 billion of liquidity available on our balance sheet. Our net economic balance sheet value after debt and preferred stock was approximately $8 per share at March 31, up over $3 quarter over quarter, primarily due to an increase in our total net performance fees, as well as an increase in value of our investment in Venerable, our variable annuity platform, related to a transaction with, with Echo. For Echo, Mark, and Scott, we're very pleased with our first quarter earnings, driven by exceptional investment performance, growing fee earnings, and continued deployment and realization activity across the platform. We look forward to further accelerating growth in our platform, including via our announcement with the team, and creating a corporate structure which will create flexibility to allocate capital to further growth at any of our businesses or to return to shareholders. Lastly, we understand the desire for more specifics surrounding the announced merger with Athene, including pro forma segment financials. And we look forward to providing that to you in, in conjunction with an investor day, which we currently anticipate holding in the fall. With that, I'll turn the call back to Peter. That concludes our remarks for the day. Operator, please open the line for questions. If you'd like to ask a question at this time, please press the star, then the number one key on your touchdown telephone. To withdraw your question, press the pound key. Again, that is barred on one if you'd like to ask a question at this time. Our first question comes from Bill Katz with Citigroup. Okay. All right, uh, thank you very much for taking the questions this morning. Uh, I was wondering if you could maybe start with uh, maybe fleshing out a little bit of the incremental spend into the retail channel, what that might look like, and then how quickly you think you could maybe leverage some of that investment? Sure. Um, so as All right. um, you probably understand, so we can hop into the, the actual the quarterlies. Channel is, uh, it did do a trailing 12-month already. Uh, so now uh, just need to finish up the 2020 numbers, which I had started a little bit, uh, but didn't really the, finish. You know, that's really the, the crux of it, investing in, in, in that space uh, to support. So we're just going to use the investment asset management beta 0.75. That's unlevered beta 0.75. We'll see what comes up to after levering, which I'm suspecting this is going to be a pretty strong amount of levering okay, maybe uh, overall, you, uh, as well as the opportunity sales to capital ratio of 0 0.45 with an adjusted net margin of 15.97 is not a terribly great balance, but we'll see. And we see in the trailing 12 months there, sales well, to capital ratio was 0 0.29, so it's not terribly um, off from that. We'll see what it looks like over the long run. Trying to do the yield business that we have built, uh, you should think of as a fixed income replacement business rather than an opportunistic credit business. So I did the net income for 2020. What we're doing is Cash flow for this type of business is very, very weird. Partially because of, like I was saying, the market effects on net income. Points of excess return around the high end, particularly the investment grade end of that fixed income marketplace. The way we do that is not by taking incremental credit risk, not by taking equity risk. We derive that return from two factors. One is structure, uh, and the other is the willingness to accept the liquidity. For a regular way, plain vanilla transaction, 
issuers will go to the, the investment grade market, the corporate market in a very methodical, easy, easy to access way and there is not excess return. But if you look at the end of last year uh, and you look at the Hertz transaction, you look at the Adnoc transaction, and you look at the Anheuser-Busch bottling transaction, what you see are three different issuers all approaching different problems, all in the investment grade ends of the spectrum that required a solution. We are one of the few participants who have the size, scale, and capacity to take down sizable investment grade transactions. And so that is what we are seeking to do. I mean, it, the most fundamental, we want 150 to 200 basis points of excess return over the comparably traded public IG, and we're willing to provide flexibility and structure and willing to accept the liquidity. This is a role that heretofore might have been provided by some of the largest banks or investment banks. And I think increasingly we will get our share of this marketplace and it represents a very attractive marketplace and fits very synergistically with all that we do in fixed income replacement given that we cover a very large swath of the investment grade market anyway. It's a very different business. By the way, if you're watching and you enjoy complicated deep dives into financials like this, please like and subscribe. Please, please, please subscribe to the channel. Very much appreciated. Thanks. Good morning, everyone. Um, I had several follow-ups with... Um, and let me know in the comments what so companies you'd like me to do next. Do you know how Gap will treat the Athene management fees after the mergers close? Yes. Um, Gap, Gap, like in everything else, will eliminate all intercompany transactions. Got it. Got it. And then, are you going to continue to report distributor earnings after the merger closes? And will it include total earnings from Athene as life insurance, free cash flow, and Gap earnings you know, don't always match up? Um, we'll give you a detailed we, – we've taken our best guess at providing uh, our view as to how we're going to report in the, through our lens net that is on our website and that we've previously disclosed. We anticipate that from a management view financials, we will report the way everyone else in the industry and the broader financial services industry reports uh, intercompany segments, which is the fair value of management fees will be reported on the asset management side and the yield less the cost of these management fees will be report, uh, reported on the insurance side. We do anticipate at this point uh, continuing to report DE. And as you see in the Through Our Lens deck, uh, we're envisioning the addition of an additional operating line of retirement services earnings. Great. Thank you. <coughs> Our next question comes from Patrick Gavitt with Autonomous Research. Uh, hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, my question is on kind of how to think about capital return post-transaction. Uh, with Fundate kind of through the netting hole now, it's clear, obviously, the cash realization out, like, look, for the kind of legacy Apollo business is looking increasingly strong. So with a theme's cash flow theoretically enough to kind of fund their growth, um, do you have any thoughts around the use of, of, of the excess cash likely to be generated from, from this very strong realization outlook on the legacy Apollo business? So uh, I'm going to give you a broader uh, answer, Mark, uh, and if it doesn't suffice, you'll have a follow-up. So <laughs> Ap Apollo itself, just the asset manager, is a highly cash-generative business. As you know, we have announced the reset of our dividend to initially $1.60 per share, which we've said will grow along with uh, the growth in the business. Just on that basis, the distributed earnings of Apollo more than covers the dividend and makes it very clear the Apollo business is very cash generative. Um, your starting point on Athene, I believe, to be too conservative. If you look back in history, Athene has actually distributed an immense amount of capital. They've just not distributed it as dividends. They've done it in terms of buybacks. They've distributed, I don't have my notes in front of me, but call it a billion two fifty plus or minus over a period of time. So now you have to step back and think about uh, how Athene produces cash on a go forward basis. Um, Athene, as you said, yes, it finances its own growth, but it also starts in a different place. It does not start at zero. Athene starts 
with $5.2 billion of excess equity capital, which is approximately $3.8 billion of excess equity on Athene's balance sheet, plus $1.7 in a just-in-time LP-driven side-by-side funding vehicle called AGENT. In addition, Athene has less than 15% debt to cap, whereas its AA peers would have about 25% debt to cap. Again, approximately another $2.5 billion. So Athene starts with about $7.5, $8 billion of excess deployable capital. And what you're also watching is a maturation of the structure. The business rolling off Athene is generally business that is rolling off that was financed 100% with Athene's capital. That's how Athene began life. The business going on the books is generally going on the books, particularly the inorganic and TRT business, but likely over time the totality of Athene's business will be approximately one-third Athene's capital and two-thirds AGENT capital. What we have tried to do is balance, is to take what heretofore may have been a capital-intensive business, make it less capital-intensive through the introduction of third-party capital. They do actually have property, plant, and equipment. They just don't list it on their balance sheet, separated from some of their other assets in the investments. So we're just going to put it at zero. You can see the bulk of their assets end up in this other asset category, partially because of the weirdness of the asset management business. But whatever, it doesn't really make a huge difference. Against an announced buck 60 dividend. I think for Investor Day, we will do our best to go through this in detail. But, you know, suffice it to say that capital allocation is one of the things that is fully within our control and is something we should be judged on. And we are all very large shareholders. But what it does is it creates options. And that option is to reinvest in the business, adding additional capacity, and or buy back stock. And we will look at that and now have the flexibility to do that every quarter and every year. Got it. Makes sense. Thank you. Our next question comes from Red Score with Evercore. Hi. Thanks very much. I would love to learn a little bit more about your thoughts on the credit secondaries market overall. I'm curious if you're seeing the same reasons for the development that you saw on the private equity side and other, meaning LP seeking liquidity for the same reason. Is it the same kind of bid-ask spread? Do you see similar trends of that addressable market? Any color there would be great. I'm curious. Trying to see how big this can get in your mind over the next 25 years. Yeah, sure, sure. So I think you're basically exactly right. The growth in credit funds over the last five, six, seven years has really been meteoric, as you all know. And the reality is CIOs, funds, pension funds are ultimately needing liquidity as they balance their portfolios just the way this occurred for the private equity business 10, 15 years ago. The real secret sauce, if you will, in a secondaries business is having the knowledge of the underlying investments to be able to move rapidly and thoughtfully around making investment decisions. And because Apollo is the largest alternative credit lender, we have views and visibility on essentially every credit product, every underlying security in the market. And so our ability, our library of knowledge to be able to smartly access this market is really unparalleled. There is really no one of scale in this space right now, but we can already start to see the demand from pension funds, others who hold these credit funds to be able to seek liquidity. So we think this is a massively scalable market where we have real first mover advantage and real expertise to allow us to be the category killer in the space. Maybe just one follow-up. Traditionally in some other 
uh, verticals, you might have a fund one, raise money, put it to work, show some performance, then wait, and then start to raise fund two. Theoretically, given what you just laid out, this money could get put to work relatively quickly, and we could see another fund relatively quickly. Does that you know, scare you off, or is that okay? No, I, I think directionally, directionally, that's right. Remember, um, when we think about this, this type of business is, is very applicable for some of our uh, existing insur insurance clients and, and otherwise. So it gives us the ability to uh, scale rapidly and opportunistically, um, but, but you are right. The, the third-party demand uh, should be pretty enormous and, and would expect to see this business uh, scale um, you know, faster than, like, say, a PE type one. Okay, thanks so much. Our next question comes from Alex Lofting, Goldman Sachs. Thank you, Greg. Good morning, everybody. Um, I, I was hoping we could spend a minute on your guys' um, sort of bigger picture growth and management fee outlook over the next couple of years. So it sounds like there's a number of new initiatives uh, in the business. Some of them are kind of being accelerated potentially uh, by the Athene deal. Uh, you talked about wealth management, a couple of other platforms. Um, can you give us a sense of kind of excluding or not sort of relying on uh, insurance-related partnerships and just really thinking about third-party investor base, um, how, how, what sort of the sustainable management fee growth do you expect to see, uh, you know, over the next, call it, three years as you go through this investment cycle? So, Alex, it's Mark. I'll give you um, the broader overview, and then I'll, I'll turn it to Martin. So, uh, you know, I think we've said broadly, first, we, we will update our targets um, at, at our next investor day. But the way at least some of us think about the business, uh, the yield business, we think we can double over the next five years. That's circa $350 billion today. I think that'll be a $700 billion plus business. And I'll come back to why and how. Uh, the opportunistic business is about a, and the hybrid business is about $110, $115 billion. And at least at first blush, I personally think they will be 50% uh, larger over the next five years. So now to dig down, and I will turn it over to Mark for a bit. Uh, if you look at the strategy we've chosen in here, it's in many ways a different strategy than our comparable peer set. We've chosen, as I alluded to on an earlier question, fixed income replacement. This was driven by the need to serve our insurance affiliates. It also, if you look at roughly the $350 billion of AUM, about 60% of that is driven by the insurance affiliates and 40% is driven by uh, third-party clients and credit funds. Um, I, I have no reason to expect that to change all that much as the business doubles. But let me get into what I mean by doubling. If you dig down in the $350 billion, my best guess is it's $125 to $150 billion of alpha with the remainder beta. For us to double that business, we need to double $125 billion of alpha. That is a large number, but it does not appear daunting to me because a lot of it is focused on platforms providing re repeatable origination. Uh, so to give you a sense of scale, we originated $17 billion of credit in the first quarter. We're on a pace to do circa $75, $80 billion for the year. And that's up from last year where we did $47 billion of credit origination for the year. So we kind of seem to have the building blocks in place. On the opportunistic side, um, I laid out the, the larger return. Scott laid out some of the more specific returns. Um, and we've made a lot of progress with announced private equity transactions. I would expect that next year we'll be in the market um, for uh, – 11, 10, excuse me, Scott's correcting me. Uh, and we are in the process of scaling a number of other strategies where we see origination capacity in excess of funds that we currently have, Asian real estate on our Asian structure and product business, infrastructure, social impact. So all in all, I see really interesting ways to grow the business. Some of this, um, and we're excluding insurance, I don't really think of the business in that context because increasingly what our limited partners and third-party investors like on the yield side of our business is the ability to co-invest side-by-side with Athena and Athora, same time, same price, same risk. 
We present ourselves to the market as an asset manager who is not only interested in fees, but is interested in the underlying asset and therefore full alignment. On the opportunistic and the hybrid side of the business, we are also in the same position, although not to the same degree. Whereas we might be 60% of the yield from affiliates, excuse, on the yield side of our business, we're probably, I'll use the uh, back of the envelope, 15 to 30% of the business on the hybrid and opportunistic side of the business. Again, these are accelerants to growing because limited partners and other third-party investors like that we have skin in the game and we eat our own cooking, whatever your best analogy is. When we have uh, previously come to talk to you, we speak to this business as a business that is roughly a 15% uh, annual growth business. Uh, in years like this, um, my gut tells me FRE will be double digits but below 15 uh, as in this is an investment year, and in years once we've made the investment, it'll be beyond 15%. But that's kind of the metric we hold ourselves to, uh, subject to update uh, at Investor Day. The things we are doing are generally designed to help us get beyond that. Martin, anything you want to add? Just Not much. The only thing I'd add is, is so man translating that into the components of FRE, management fee growth should be teams in line with what we've produced. We see no reason that that won't uh, continue in the future. We are very focused on growing our origination businesses and growing, and growing our transaction fees as, as you say, and we expect that, that to continue. And then yeah, the cash flow statement of a so asset management company is very, very weird because you have to account for all the changes uh, in the value of their investments uh, and unrealized gains kind of related. Uh, and performance allocations, which is basically them recognizing certain portions of it belonging to the owners of the fund, uh, yeah, all sorts of weird stuff. Very, very chaotic cash flow statement, that's for sure, year to year. Okay, great. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I want to come back to the conversation on um, the retail channel and, and the opportunity as you guys uh, lean in there more, it sounds like. Um, and, and maybe just to talk a little bit about where you are. Hopefully over the, after we put in several years, over the long run, it'll actually look pretty neat once you average it all out. But that may not be the case because, uh, you know, a good asset management company is making investments for the long run. So you might have a whole lot of negative cash flow years, but essentially be building up your assets. And those assets aren't necessarily going to pay off into cash flow for, I mean, who knows, a decade. Sure. So depending on what you're doing, um, I would say obviously, you know, w when we look at uh, Apollo's uh, you know, product platform, uh, certainly yield products are going to be the place we, you know, we lead into the uh, into the global wealth channel, um, and that, you know, we're already, you know, making making inroads there. Uh, I think it's still early days to see uh, sort of substantial, you know, move the move the line item type results but you know really we look at this over a you know two three four year in you know investment period where you know by that time frame you'll see you know meaningful you know uh, meaningful progress there but in the meantime it's about you know uh, taking products we have getting it through through the retail channel and continuing to develop and tailor products Amen. that um you know, we're, we we learn, or, or more specifically, uh, targeting targeting those components. Maybe, maybe it's Mark. I'll, I'll add, and I'll step back. Look, there is a trend uh, toward the what we say is democratization of finance. Um, that trend was more pronounced under Republican administration. It likely will be less pronounced under a Democratic administration. But nonetheless, it is a trend, and it's a trend we expect to continue. We see increased sophistication. Uh, in the retail and the high net worth channels. And so if you step back and you look at uh, from our point of view, we have for a very long time been a distributor of opportunistic products to the high net worth channel through private equity and a number of the other funds. What you will see us do in that channel is continue to, to do what we've been doing, to build it out, to redouble our efforts. We have made significant hires in this area. And we intend to follow through, and I would think on balance you will see greater fundraising coming out of this channel this year, next year, and in, in the future. And I do think that this is a trend 
when we look back over the next five or ten years, we will see retail high net worth as a larger percentage of total opportunistic fundraise than it has been over the past decade. Then I go to completely to the other end of the spectrum, and let's talk about Athene. So Athene is now the number one underwriter of retail annuities in the U.S. It is a substantial footprint. A footprint includes um, independent broker-dealer, it includes banks, it includes other forms of distribution that I would say are more retail and less high net worth. They have made the investments in systems and infrastructure necessary to support a complex product set. This Christ. is a complex product set. Even if these, these, this product set is all income-based. What Scott is focused on is in between the two. I believe, and Scott believes, and Jim believes, and the whole team believes, that we have the opportunity uh, to continue to package our yield-oriented products in ways that can go through the high net worth and the retail channel. And the investments there have also been made in people and teams and will continue to be made. You will see us launch at the second half of this year uh, at least two products through this channel that are yield-based. Again, when we look back over the next five or ten years and compare it to the past decade, we will see continued democratization. Our job, I believe, is to come at this channel with our unique value proposition, which is not simply to sell as much as we can. It is to focus on what I believe the franchise does extraordinarily well, which is excess return at every point along the risk-reward curve from private equity down to investment grade. The product set that we ultimately uh, expand on retail uh, is a product set we can have our own design, but it is ultimately up to the channel and the end consumer as to which of those products are more applicable. And it's our job to make them available and make our capabilities available and to support them with the requisite infrastructure, be it technology infrastructure or people and wholesale infrastructure to do. Um, this should not be unknown. Others in our industry have done it. Others have, quite frankly, been there first and are bigger. Uh, and there's plenty of uh, roadmap for us to follow, for us to use this as an accelerant to what we otherwise are doing. And it seems very logical and obvious to us. Our next question comes from Ken Worthington with J.P. Morgan. Hi, uh, good morning. Um, the total AUM in the Thora stepped down from 4Q to 1Q in the non-subadvised area, and you mentioned in the prepared remarks that rates had a negative impact on an Athene and a Thora this quarter. Um, the step down of the Thora assets with more than 10 percent, is it possible to get a bit more color here uh, on if it was just rates or if there were other factors as well? Huge jump in debt. In 2020, as you can see, we went from like 3.7 billion in total debt in 2019 to 14.6 billion in debt in 2020. But you can also likewise see that the the change in their investments went from 8.4 billion to 23.6 billion. The majority of it being in this other asset category, but that's also where their uh, investments essentially are. So, yeah, part of what I mean by like the cash flow being extremely, extremely weird in this company. I mean, huge inflows from uh, new clients. Those uh, inflows uh, are technically liabilities in a form, and then you also make huge investments in in debt to do that, and that's a, out, a huge cash outflow. But that creates assets on the balance sheet. Our next question comes from very very odd business model as far as uh, trying to read it through gap accounting. On your views on consolidation opportunities and insurance. And I'm wondering how you think higher rates might impact that outlook. So uh, I'll do my best, uh, Mark. So in general, as Martin said, higher rates are better for our business. Uh, first, we have an investment portfolio that has a decent amount of floaters in it on the Athene balance sheet. Um, and second, um, higher rates um, can also help in pricing of new business, including <coughs> to company to company new business. Um, so, but I don't actually think that rates themselves have 
material impact on the ability or willingness of people to demand that. Um, what we are watching is, in my opinion, a realignment of the guaranteed, or as we say in the U.S., annuity-led uh, insurance system. You're seeing companies, particularly companies who may not have the ability to create asset alpha, which is ultimately what drives the business, sell large blocks of business. They sell this through reinsurance. They sell this through, through company sales. And for the most part, it is being sold to people who have the capacity to generate alpha amongst assets that are appropriate for insurance company balance sheets, which tend to be investment grade or quasi investment grade assets. I see no let up in that trend. And I think this rotation out of guarantee yield and into mortality, PNC, and fee for service uh, in both the US and Western Europe is healthy. Uh, our business, in my opinion, will not be limited in growth by our ability to source liability, only by prudence with respect to returns. And here I will give you a little, a little more color. Um, Athene last year, and uh, when they announced their fourth quarter, they gave, gave some indication as to the profitability of the retail business they are generating. Typically, they have done between 15 and 20 percent cash on cash unlevered for new retail annuity business. Last year was at the higher end of that range. Uh, they will report on Friday and will give some notion of the profitability of business in the first quarter. If we are um, return maximizers or we are trying to build a long term sustainable business, we should want to garner the lowest cost of funds and therefore the highest level of repeat profitability for a decade for our retirement services business. Our ability to generate profitability at retail, which is the lowest risk, most repeatable, most franchised nature, does put a floor on our willingness as to what we're prepared to pay for large blocks uh, of annuities. It's not just about growth. It's about sustainable, profitable growth and not simply growing the business for the sake of growing the business. So the message I would convey, there are immense blocks of business that will trade. The blocks of business in the U.S. are well known. The blocks of business in Europe, in my opinion, are larger and less well known. And very few people have the platform that we have to be able to consolidate those blocks of business. In any one quarter, you can see blocks trade or not trade, uh, but we will continue to be focused on underwriting profitable new business rather than new business. Our next question comes from Mike Carrier with Bank of America. Right, good morning. Thanks for taking the question. <clears throat> um, Apollo has had a, a lot of change over the past six months, and, and with that, you know, roles and responsibilities can shift around. Um, so since Josh wasn't on the call and Leon is no longer in the mix, just can you provide an update on on uh, leadership and responsibilities like across segments and with LPs, and then any additional you know expected changes ahead? Uh, I'll, I'll since Mark I'll lead off. Uh, always uncomfortable to talk about myself, but I, I we'll do our best. Uh, so I am the CEO of the business. The lanes I have picked out for myself are strategy, culture, which includes compensation, communication, urgent strategic initiatives, and dealing with problems. I am fortunate to be able to rely on an incredibly talented group led by Jim Felter and Scott Kleiner, who run the day-to-day -day of the Apollo business. They, in turn, have their own next generation that makes their job easier. At Retirement Services, uh, as a pro forma for consolidation, you have a business that is led by Jim Bellardi, Bill Wheeler, Marty Klein, Grant Kvalheim, all of whom have been there a long period of time and I've worked with on a day-to-day -day basis. If you step back and really think about the business, there's been a lot of external change, but I try not to lose sight that we actually grew the business by $145 billion in a year. 
most of the change that's taken place has actually taken place within the business. And what is external is mostly noise for us. This is now my 31st year at Apollo, my 36th year in business. I grew up in the opportunistic side of the business for 20 of those years, and I've grown up on the retirement services on the yield side of the business for the last decade plus. This is not a new job. It's very clear what we need to do. We are we're very focused on what it is we de that we define the firm. We define the firm as providing excess return at every point along the risk reward, reward spectrum that we choose to participate in. We have really good talent, whether it's demographics, market structure, or otherwise. We have a strategy that is focused on the three business segments I've outlined. Opportunistic, which I think this group and on the phone understands the best. Hybrid, which is the middle between opportunistic and yield. And then yield. Yield is by far and away the largest segment of our business and the fastest growing segment of our business. And we have chosen a strategy that plays to our strengths. Fixed income replacement. This is a trend that is actually, it makes our business in many ways totally different than our peer set. First, it is an easier business to scale just by the nature of its business. Second, 60% of that scaling to date has been through our affiliates. Third, we present ourselves to the market in a unique way as aligned with our partners because we take 50, 60 cents of every trade, same time, same price. So for the most part, we go about our business and we execute. Yes, we have had changes in roles. Josh is less involved in compensation, uh, which seems like a natural given that I'm now the CEO. Josh is an active and productive and senior member of the Apollo team. He's on the board. He's on the executive committee. He chairs our transaction committee, which reviews our largest opportunistic deal. We get up for business every day and we execute. Our next question comes from Robert Green with CBW. Uh, great. Good morning. Thanks for taking my question. Um, Jesus. You know, I guess it may seem a bit odd uh, question because given that there's so you ought to have so many new initiatives uh, going on with uh, expanding origination platforms and quite a secondary business, but can you talk a little bit more broadly, maybe on a regional basis? I mean, a lot of your peers have been, you know, pretty vocal and aggressive about their expansion. Uh, in the Asia, in the Asia pack in particular, some through acquisition, mostly organic. You know, it's not an area where you you have a presence, but haven't talked about as much. Can you maybe just update us on how you're thinking of down the road, kind of you know your reach, your global and uh, regional footprint, and the opportunities there? Okay, um, I'll take a shot at this, Mark, and then I'll I'll hand it to Scott. Um, so. When you step back and you look at our business, there's no denying that our business is primarily focused on the U.S. Uh, and Western Europe, with a little bit in Australia and a little bit in Japan. Um, that is the outline of our business, and it's within the context of our strategy, and what I've outlined of doubling our yield business and a 50% increase in our opportunistic business, I believe we can accomplish that within our geography. Having said that, we have been active in the broader Asian market for a long period of time. We have not elected to move large opportunistic funds into those marketplaces. The unique calling card that I believe that we have leverages the strength of the firm to provide capital where there is excess return. For me, I believe that excess return to be primarily in yield and in structured product, and you should expect us to use the things that we do best to differentiate ourselves in markets that are not short of capital and function quite differently than the U.S. and Western European market. Well, look, I, I, would agree with, I would agree with Mark. The, uh, while historically uh, Asia has not been a, a huge target area for Apollo because we've been able to pursue all the growth you know, we want and, and uh, uh, find the market opportunities we're looking for in uh, North America and Western Europe, um, we're not blind to, to the opportunity set. Uh, we are uh, starting to make small inroads, as, as Mark said, in places like Japan, 
uh, and uh, Australia. Uh, but I would expect to see more over time, but on, on a measured basis. Um, it's not something uh, that you know, we feel like we have to jump in tomorrow, but um, it, it is obviously a, a big dynamic market and one which uh, over time we will, we will continue to incrementally grow into. Our next question comes from Michael Cypress. Good morning, Dan. Hey, good morning. Thanks for putting me in here. Uh, just a question on um, as insurance becomes a more meaningful business for you guys, you know, investors may want to better appreciate maybe potential balance sheet risks. I just can you talk about how you think about and assess balance sheet risk on the insurance side as, as that comes over with the theme? What metrics will you be tracking? And if there is a problem or issue with one area of the portfolio, how might you see that from the outside of the bank and mark the market or at least the P through the P&L at least? And what sort of sensitivities or scenario analysis do you look at uh, that you might be able to share with us uh, on the outside? Okay, so um, first, um, in, for the retirement services business, the the issue and the risk has always been on the outside. That is where I believe investors should focus. That is where we have focused. Um, there's very little volatility around, I'll call it traditional measures of insurance type risk like mortality and longevity or unexpected optionality on the part of policyholders. It is primarily an asset risk game. We have grown up and the entire firm has grown up with this theme by a relatively simple philosophy. Retirement services insurance companies are a terrible place to take credit risk. They're a terrible place to take equity risk. But they are ideally situated to take some amount of liquidity risk since most of their liabilities are illiquid and structural risk. And that is what you find on the theme balance sheet. So we've now been through 12 years. There's 12 years of metric. There's not whatever cycles have taken place in those 12 years we have written out. Um, and you can look at our portfolio and I would encourage you to benchmark it not against other annuity companies, take the highest quality, best thought of peer group, and I gave some of this in the through our lens deck, take crew, take met, take principal, um, and you will see whether it's a measure of losses, of capital buffer, of use of leverage, or anything else, we have outperformed the double A benchmarks. We have always been, Apollo has always been, the residual equity holder of the risks that we take. Initially, we were a 35% equity holder, some two and a half billion of value, and now we are going to be a 100% equity holder. The risk mentality mindset has not changed. So now I focus down into the specifics of your question. We do put out extensive credit decks. If you go back and you look at the period just after um, the the lockdowns in the U.S., you will see an extensive deck on our CLO portfolio. You will see an extensive deck on our CRE portfolio. You will see one on energy. You will see one on aircraft lending. And we will continue to do this. The granularity of information that we put out, there's nothing else like it in the insurance industry that I am aware of. This is how we run and monitor the business. We report on a quarterly basis in terms of whether they run through the P&L or not. So you will get that updated information. But I assure you, this is where the magic happens. If you get this wrong, it is a big negative. If you get this right, it provides competitive advantage. What we seek to do in retirement services across the entirety of the portfolio is to earn 40 basis points across a portfolio better than the comparable publicly traded investment grade op option set or opportunity set. It's not 200 more, it's 40 more. And it's primarily a fixed income investment grade portfolio that benefits from stepping back from the fully liquid market. The, the only thing I'd add, I'd add, Mike, is just as a reminder, you know, Apollo today manages 100% of the left side of the team's balance sheet. So, there's an Apollo professional who knows 
you know, every single thing, you know, is tied to every line item on the on the Dean asset uh, balance sheet. So uh, the same care and feeding we, you know, we provide across our entire credit business is all. Yeah, you gotta love this net income. It's up and down, up and down, up and down. The actual cl closing of okay. the uh, of the merger, nothing changes in the, in that respect. I believe we are coming to averaging 659 million over that five year period. Our last question comes from Jerry. Or really 4.25 year period. All right. Uh, thanks for uh, thanks for taking the question and and perhaps just uh, to mix it up a little bit, um, maybe you can give us an update on on just the real estate segment. I think historically there there's been some frustration around the uh, growth trajectory of that business. And uh, Mark, maybe you can kind of give give us a give us a sense of how you see you know this this segment growing forward. Whether there's still an appetite for inorganic growth, or um, or just what your kind of general thoughts are on um, on real estate. Thank you. Okay, so I'll, I'll start, and then I will uh, pass to Scott and Martin if they have anything to add. But uh, I'm going to start with something that will be surprising. We have an immense growth. Um, uh, Martin will uh, give you a better exact number, but we're 50 billion of real assets. They're just not located in one place. A lot of it is located in lending, and a lot of it is located in our European uh, principal finance business, and then in our net lease business, and then in our US opportunistic business, and in our Asian and Indian opportunistic and structured products business. It's harder to find as one line item. But it also goes back to philosophy about how we think about the business. We think about the business in three buckets, opportunistic, hybrid, and yield. Real assets cuts across all three of those buckets. You will find real estate across all three buckets. I will say uh, reflexively, we are sizable, but not immense in opportunistic real estate. reward and view of the marketplace and skill set. You will find us really large in hybrid and in yield across real estate, which is a function of our risk reward and our skill set. I would expect real assets broadly defined to continue to be an incredibly important part of what we do. I think you will see real assets mixed into platforms, which we call yield and yield. You will see it in our hybrid business. You will see it on our structured products business. And you will see it to a lesser extent uh, in our opportunistic business. And we have absolutely no qualms about being acquisitive in this area. And I would expect that we will be acquisitive in this area. And I think one of the things that we will do on investor day is drop down below the broad line items of yield and hybrid and opportunistic and provide the requisite pie charts which allow people to see just how big this real asset business is and how big the origination businesses are uh, and otherwise. Uh, because I think it will surprise people that we've just come at this in a different way. Right? The fact that we're coming at it differently shouldn't surprise anyone. Yeah, the only thing I would add, I mean, uh, Mark, Mark summed it up well. I mean, we see the opportunity set as actually really great in, in this space. And, you know, when, when we do sort of break out the detail for you, you'll see uh, th this business will more than double in, in, in the time frame uh, that, that we're talking about, the, you know, the, the, the five-year time frame. And so th there's just, um, you know, we're seeing it in the opportunity set that each of these businesses that Mark talked about um, uh, you know, the, the, the investment opportunities that, that they're approaching right now. And so the ability for scaling is enormous, and it's a place that, you know, we're, we're, we're focused on. So I, I would expect to, to see that um, as we move in the coming quarters and years. I want to thank you all for attending. Glad we were able to uh, take everyone's questions. I know we were.
Good morning, and welcome to Apollo Global's management's first fourth quarter 2020 earnings conference call. During today's discussion, all callers will be placed in a listen-only mode, and following management's prepared remarks, the conference call will be open for questions. This conference call is being recorded. This call may include forward-looking statements and projections which do not guarantee future events or performance. Please refer to Apollo's most recent SEC filings for risk factors related to these statements. Apollo will be discussing certain non-GAAP measures on this call, which management believes are relevant in assessing the financial performance of the business. These non-GAAP measures are reconciled to GAAP figures in Apollo's earnings presentation, which is available on the company's website. Also note that nothing on this call constitutes an offer to sell or solicitation of an offer to purchase an interest in Apollo Fund. I would now like to turn the call over to Peter Minsberg, Head of Investor Relations. Thanks, Operator, and welcome to our fourth quarter 2020 earnings call. As many of you know, I joined the firm in November as Head of Investor Relations, and I'm very glad to be here with you all today for my first earnings call with Apollo. Joining me this morning are Mark Rowan, Josh Harris, and Martin Kelly. Jim Zelter and Scott Kleiman are also on the line for questions. I'd like to turn it over to Mark to kick off our comment for today. Thanks, Peter. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm excited to be here following the conclusion of my very poorly planned recent sabbatical. I look forward to engaging with our investors and shareholders as I transition into my new role. As you will hear in more detail, the Apollo platform is strong, resilient, extremely well positioned for growth in today's landscape as our exceptional 2020 results have demonstrated. Before I turn to the quarter and the year, I want to review the announcements that were contained in the various communications last week. I will first touch on governance, then leadership, and lastly, our investors. In terms of governance, we believe the changes described in Leon's letter last week were an important step in our evolution from here. a private partnership to the standards set by the best public companies. Our industry is in transition. Our firm is in transition. All of us are moving from the small private partnerships that we started life as to important components of a more global financial system. Proper governance and transparency are going to be essential to play the role that we are supposed to play in this marketplace. Specifically as a firm, we are com committed to moving promptly to a governance structure that will enhance our board with additional diversity, possessing different viewpoints to bring experience to bear that is needed to help drive our business forward. We are committed to moving our board to two-thirds independent over the near term, and we are committed to appointing a lead independent director who will actively and regularly engage with the management and the board. As it relates to directors, we have already made substantial progress. Uh, last week, we announced that Pam Joyner and Sid Mukherjee will be joining our board effective March 1st. Further, we are in active dialogue to bring additional high-quality talent on board to help us drive the business forward at our board of directors level. Beyond the board changes, as we have alluded to, we have begun a process with our independent committee of the board to promptly evaluate and review the steps necessary for Apollo to adopt a one-share, one-vote structure and other changes that will be required to be eligible for us to be included in a broader set of market indices. These changes, I believe, would be incredibly beneficial for our firm and, again, further reflect our commitment to moving to a more modern state given the important role that we play in the financial landscape. I believe the independent committee of the board will return promptly with their recommendations, and we will take it from there. Away from the governance changes, we are making a series of changes to Apollo's leadership. Leon will be retiring as CEO and will remain chairman of the board. Josh will remain a co-founder and member of the board and executive committee, working with our largest investors, evolving our integrated platform, and expanding the strategic opportunities where we look for investment. Scott and Jim will be assuming additional responsibilities as we all realign our areas of focus. We are fortunate to have an incredibly deep bench of talented partners who have been together a very long time. Leon, Josh, and I have been together and been partners for more than 30 years. We have been 
to all kinds of market cycles and all kinds of events. And I expect our partnership to endure for a very long time. Having reviewed governance and leadership, let me now turn to speak about our investors. This has been a busy week plus of communication with our investors. We have had an opportunity to speak with a very broad cross-section of our limited partners uh, and their advisors and consulting relationships regarding the conclusion of the Conflicts Committee review and the governance and leadership changes. The vast majority have indicated that they are satisfied with the announcements, which they and we believe strike the right balance for the firm. Perhaps most importantly, they appreciated the seriousness with which we took the process and the transparency. As we expected, a smaller portion of our investors will need time to consider these events and the changes we are implementing, and in some instances, they may actually want to see how these changes unfold. We realize that we may not be able to satisfy each and every of more than our 100, excuse me, 1,500 institutional investors, but we have made tremendous progress. We must continuously strive to improve our process and governance, and most importantly, to deliver superior investment returns to our investors. We expect third-party fundraising to build significantly now that we have addressed these issues. The strength of the business shows that even in this past quarter with these headwinds, we continue to raise money across a number of funds and syndicated more than $9 billion of investments amongst our limited partners and insurance affiliates. As I said, the business powers ahead. As Josh will discuss, this was a record year for Apollo across multiple metrics. AUM is at a record high, increasing by more than $22 billion in this quarter alone. The momentum in this business is strong, and as we implement these various changes, I expect that momentum to increase. Now to take a step back, um, this is a unique time for me to become CEO of Apollo. We are a growth business, and we are fortunate to be a provider of a service that's in incredibly high demand, namely investment returns. In addition to the product we provide, our market is growing, and it's growing dramatically. We primarily serve retirees either directly through our insurance affiliates in the form of guaranteed income, or indirectly with our yield and opportunistic products through institutions like retirement systems, pension plans, endowments, sovereign wealth funds, and others. All of these clients we serve are looking for investment returns, and it is our job to continue to grow our front end, meaning our ability and capacity to generate good returns per unit of risk assumed. While the AUM growth this year is nothing short of substantial, it's spectacular. Growing AUM is just a measure and not a goal in itself. It is the result of good performance. For good managers like Apollo, the ability to raise money is not the primary governor of our growth. It is our capacity in difficult markets to source investments that provide above average returns for the risks undertaken. As long as we maintain our capacity and grow our capacity to produce returns, AUM will follow. I feel fortunate to be leading an incredibly healthy business. I believe we have a unique opportunity Apollo, at Apollo based on the strength of our people, coupled with our investment expertise across numerous sectors and the benefit of our permanent capital vehicles. We are strategically positioned at the intersection of growth, yield, and value. Our particular edge is being able to source assets that cater to a range of capital structures from lower yield insurance company balance sheets to high return opportunity funds. In a market that is characterized by indexation, correlation, and volatility, I believe that presents a unique opportunity for Apollo's style of investing to really stand out. An Apollo portfolio is fundamentally different than a BlackRock portfolio, a Blackstone portfolio, or anyone else else's portfolio. The unique skill, the unique DNA of Apollo. We're not like the other asset managers. Up and down the risk reward spectrum that represent good returns per unit of risk undertaken. So long as we stick to that tenant, we will continue to be successful and we will continue to grow our firm. I would be remiss not to take a moment to thank Apollo's more than 1,500 employees around the world. They have worked tirelessly in a very difficult year to
to achieve the impressive results we have announced today. I'm extremely proud of the extraordinary team, their perseverance and dedication they have demonstrated throughout this very interesting year. With that, I turn it over to Josh to cover our strong results for the year. Thanks, Mark. We're all really glad to have you back from semi sabbatical I'd like to begin by acknowledging the unprecedented challenges we have all faced this past year as individuals, as an organization, and as society. The impacts of this global health and economic crisis, including illness, innumerable losses, record unemployment, and extreme market volatility are far-reaching and will be felt for a long, long time. Thank you to all the essential workers who have worked tirelessly to get us through this difficult time and who continue to push our country forward. Despite this challenging backdrop, Apollo delivered very strong results for the year, validating the resilience and differentiation of our business model. We acted quickly to help our investors, many of whom are the frontline workers getting us through this crisis, while at the same time helping many great companies during simulating circumstances by providing liquidity solutions. We, record, we reported record inflows of $123 billion and achieved deployment activity of $88 billion. We generated record fee-related earnings of $2.37 per share, reflecting 15% growth year over year, and have surpassed $1 billion of FRE for the first time in our firm's history. In addition, we've exceeded $450 billion of AUM, another milestone for the firm. For the fourth quarter, we reported distributable earnings of $0.72 cents per common share, pre-tax fee-related earnings, or FRE, of $0.63 cents per share, and a cash dividend of $0.60 cents per share. We ended 2020 at $455 billion of AUM, growing 38% year-over-year as a result of a record inflow year, which included $13 billion of inflows for the fourth quarter. Organic growth accounted for 16% of the 38% increase in AUM, with two insurance transactions creating the remaining 22% increase. Specifically, the $123 billion of inflows for the year was driven by $72 billion of inflows from the two notable insurance transactions, which created additional scale for both Athene and Athora. $17 billion of organic growth in our insurance platform and $22 billion of third-party capital raising across our new large-scale origination platform, ASOP. New vintages of existing fund franchise, such as Hybrid Value and Accord, and new product initiatives, including the IPO of our Apollo Strategic Growth Capital SPAC, and the launch of our first Infrastructure Opportunities Fund. Turning to deployment, the breadth and differentiation of our platform resulted in $88 billion invested this year on behalf of our clients. This deployment included repositioning and growth in the assets of Athena and Flora's balance sheet following the few transactions during the year, organic growth at the insurance platforms, and growth in our private credit origination business. In a year marked by so much change, our role as a capital solutions provider for companies greatly expanded. Our original our origination capabilities continue to broaden and now span middle market and large cap corporate lending, as well as numerous asset-based lending categories. We see a large opportunity for Apollo to continue leveraging its intellectual capital across credit, private equity, and real assets to meet the needs of our clients and provide solutions to a diverse set of companies. In the fourth quarter, we provided $9.3 billion of bespoke off-the-run, long-dated capital solutions for investment-grade companies. Among these included a $4 billion dip financing for Hertz, which provided a structured solution for its fleet, a $3.1 billion transaction for Anheuser-Busch, InBev's container manufacturing business. Each of these deals was customized to the needs of the respective company and demonstrate our ability to create a wide spectrum of bespoke financing solutions to corporations. 
Returning to FRE, the momentum we generated through our robust AUM growth and capital deployment translated into growth in our fee-related earnings, which reached $2.37 per year, and grew 15% year over year. Management fees grew to $1.65 billion, up 11% year over year, and demonstrated very little correlation with volatile public markets. We made several important investments across the platform in 2020, focused on expanding our origination capabilities, furthering new growth initiatives such as our infrastructure, impact, and SPAC strategies, scaling our technology and infrastructure groups across the firm. In addition to the strong financial results we achieved in 2020, Paul and its portfolio companies focused significant attention on providing support to one another and our broader community. We continue to prioritize and realize the full value of environmental, social, and governance factors strong, and, and believe strongly that seizing ESG opportunities makes us better investors and better stewards by positioning upon our fund's portfolio companies for sustainable success. Just as important, we believe that Apollo can and should have a positive impact on society beyond its businesses, helping to make the world a better place and improving people's lives. In line with that mission, we were proud to launch a citizenship grant program, matching employees' charitable contributions and rewarding employees' volunteer time. This year, we donated more than $50 million to philanthropic causes and contributed 3,550 hours of service. Through the matching program, employees have donated to more than 1,500 different nonprofit organizations to date. To echo Mark's comments, our firm's resiliency and strong business model strategically position us for success in today's evolving market landscape. Our financial position is strong, anchored by $273 billion of AUM in permanent capital vehicles, 60% of our total AUM. Our fee-related earnings continue to grow through varying market environments, close to 100% of our pre-tax earnings in 2020 derived from FRE, giving our shareholders high visibility into our core earnings drivers. Looking ahead, we anticipate increased demand for Apollo's investment expertise. Investors continue to struggle with sourcing yield, driving demand for proprietary and scaled origination. Investors increasingly seek global scaled asset managers with the ability to create solutions for a wide variety of mandates across lower cost capital, such as insurance to higher return opportunistic capital. We believe the path forward is right for Apollo, and we're incredibly excited to continue on this strong trajectory. I speak for the entire management team expressing our deep gratitude to our bench of talent who have come together to drive su the success we've experienced this year. Thank you. We are very much looking forward to what 2021 will bring for our firm. With that, I'll turn it over to Martin. Thanks, Josh. Um, let me touch on FRE, DE, and dividend to start with. For the fourth quarter, management fees grew 3% over the prior quarter, 13% over the fourth quarter of 2019. Driven by growth in fees for investing in the assets of our insurance clients, as well as deployment-driven growth in our credit and real asset businesses. For the full year 2020, management fees grew 11% over the prior year. Transaction and advisory fees were $81 million in the quarter, driven by capital solutions transactions and private equity activity. Compensation grew 8% over the prior quarter. This reflects our continued investment in growth initiatives across the firm, including support for our insurance businesses. Headcount grew by more than 20% in each of the last two years, driven by the growth areas that Josh has highlighted. Non-compensation costs grew 12% over the prior quarter and included costs related to the independent review. For the fourth quarter, we announced a dividend of $0.60 cents per share and after-tax distrib distributable earnings of $0.72 cents per share, our highest quarter since the fourth quarter of 2019. 
Our strong FRE of 63 cents per share was supported by, by net incentive earnings of 15 cents per share. Turning to incentive realizations, we realized $187 million in gross performance fees for the fourth quarter, primarily related to our credit strategies fund, which returned 24% in 2020. Gains from sales in Fund 8 were returned to LPs as a result of the impairments recognized in the first half of 2020. At the end of the fourth quarter, the netting hole in Fund 8 had been reduced to $266 million, equivalent to six cents per share of delayed net carry, down from $1.1 billion as of the second quarter. This fourth quarter reduction was driven principally by a secondary transaction for Varelia during the quarter. As a reminder, Fund 8 remains in full carry, with a current gross and net IRR of 16 and 11 percent, respectively. The clawback obligations of 31 cents per share that we report in our earnings release are related to older legacy funds, including Fund 7 and Natural Resources 1, are specific to those funds and are not cross-collateralized across other funds. As we have noted in the past, we do not expect any of these claw clawback amounts to become cash obligations for at least several years from now. Deployment in our funds was 2.5 billion, in our drawdown funds was $2.5 billion in the fourth quarter and $17 billion for the full year in line with annual averages. Our broader measure of deployment, which reflects the breadth of our origination business, was again strong at $24 billion for the fourth quarter $88 billion for the year. The fourth quarter deployment was supported by the large origination activities Josh highlighted, as well as a pickup in middle market and commercial real estate lending. Our dry powder for investments across our fund complex was $47 billion at the end of the quarter, of which $21 billion has the potential to drive management fees when invested. On performance, uh, moving on to investment performance during the fourth quarter, our private equity funds portfolio appreciated by 13%, driven by strong performance across our funds' public and private holdings. Fund 8 and Fund 9 appreciated by 10% and 17% respectively, driving an increase in the net carry asset to $1.82 per share. Fund 8 is now marked at a multiple of invested capital of 1.6 times, and we expect it to continue to create value as the portfolio matures. Fund 9 crossed into carry for the first time in the fourth quarter. For the full year, our private equity fund's portfolio appreciated 6.9%, which compares favorably to the performance of the S&P value index, down 1.4%. In credit, our fund's aggregate portfolio returned 4.4% during the quarter. Through a very volatile year in the credit markets, we were able to protect our portfolios on the downside and outperform global indices. Notably, for 2020, our global corporate credit business generated a 6.7% total return, reflecting over 300 basis points of outperformance to its benchmark. In addition, the performance of broadly syndicated loans in our credit portfolio exceeded the S&P LOI by approximately 140 basis points for the year. High yield bond performance exceeded the B of A uh, Merrill Lynch high yield index by nearly 800 basis points for the same period. <coughs> our strong credit performance has been driven in part by the excess spread we have been able to generate for our insurance clients, which stems from our differentiated and expanding origination capabilities. In real assets, our overall return for the quarter was up 3.1%, driven by broad appreciation across the portfolio. Energy continued to have a de minimis impact on our performance in both private equity and credit this quarter. Apollo remains in a very strong liquidity position with approximately $1.6 billion of liquidity available on our balance sheet. Our net economic balance sheet after debt and preferred stock was approximately $4.80 per share at December 31, ahead of the $4.25 at the end of 2019 and prior to the pandemic-induced sell-off. Roco Josh, we're very pleased with our 2020 earnings, driven by robust growth and resilient fee revenues. We're appreciative of the support that we have received from employees, shareholders, investors, and partners throughout the year. I look forward to engaging with you all further in 2021 and beyond. With that, I'll turn the call back to you. Thank you, Martin.
That concludes our remarks for the day. Operator, please open the line for questions. Thank you. As a reminder, to ask a question, you'll need to press star 1 on your telephone. To withdraw your question, press the pound key. Our first question comes from Glenn Shore with Everport. Your line is open. Hi. Uh, thanks very much. Um, maybe one for Mark, just up, up at the top, big picture. I think it's good to see back back to the growth and the growth front on the front foot. But uh, with credit insurance, let's call it 75% of, of assets, private equity already huge and great. I'm, I'm just curious, as you think about building for the next decade, where real estate, infrastructure, retail, capital markets, like the other areas uh, to grow and broaden Apollo to help uh, investors with your mission. I'd be curious to get your thoughts on that. Um, okay. Um, you, you touched on some of it, but I'll start with um, how I think. Um, the limit on our growth, um, which you're referring to, is not the ability to raise money. It is the ability to deploy it sensibly in an Apollo-esque manner. Uh, in the private equity business, we are large. We will continue to grow, but you're right. That will not be a source of massive growth. Um, the credit business is large in a sense that we talk about, but in the context of the markets that we participate in, we're just beginning. We have an amazing opportunity in credit, uh, particularly with respect to origination. Um, in the real estate market, which you also touched on, we have an immense real estate footprint. We simply don't group it in our financials or in our assets because much of what we do in the real estate business is in real uh, rather than in opportunity. Uh, we are building the real estate business. The real estate business uh, is raising funds in the U.S. opportunity market, uh, in the Asian opportunity market, in the net lease market, in the debt market, and in the core plus market. On every one of our insurance company balance sheets, real estate is an expanding category, and I would expect our real estate business to increase. We have a lot of white space, but it has to be done in an Apollo-esque way. Infrastructure. Infrastructure one, uh, double-digit rates of return uh, in the infrastructure market, back out in the market with infrastructure two, again, an area that I expect to expand in a big way, impact, exactly the same thing. All right, I think Everyone 2014 ties them together. will only be the last year we're going to do for them simply go out and raise you AUM. if we but need to. Identification of an opportunity that we believe reflects Apollo. 13. The Apollo investment brand fundamentally means that we are, believe we are taking less... How many years back I go for any individual company kind of depends on a few other factors, but it's kind of subjective. It's like, a, you know, you need like a minimum of five. Um, seven would be better. And then depending on the company, you might want to go further back, especially if they have R&D costs because of the R&D amortization technique that I use, but they don't even have any R&D, so that's irrelevant for this company. But I think 2014 gets us like eight, including the trailing 12 month, which is technically, like I said, only a quarter forward from the 2020s. But either way, we're still counting it. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We go in eight. Your line is open. Good enough. Thanks. Good morning, everyone. Good enough. Staying healthy. Skip. My question is, what is the potential timeline for this full C corp conversion? It's good to go further back so you have a better understanding of the history of the company, but technically the further far you back, if you don't have like a quantifiable reason for doing so, well then, I mean, technically you're getting further away from something that actually is the company. Because, uh, you know, companies change over time. Different people are running it. Different attitudes, different strategies, different growth avenues. Broad index inclusion, which would include a full C-Corp conversion. I would expect we will hear back from them. Um, at no later than our next conference call. With that, as to the specific steps, I'll turn it over to Mark. Yeah, Craig, there's... there's More useful to spend a higher level of time diving even deeper into the last, like, three years than uh, necessarily doing a, a broad but not necessarily super deep look at something 12 years ago, you know? Impacts and different timelines associated with them, frankly. So we, we're working through all the details around that and the approvals that will be needed from different constituents. Uh, in, in view of, of, um, of, of what different outcomes might be. So, so you know, we're, 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 we, we, know, we know what's ahead of us. We're working through all the considerations, and then we'll update you in due course. Thank you. Our next question comes from Alex Blostein. Your line is from Goldman Sachs. Your line is open. 
Great, thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, Mark, I was hoping to dig in a little bit more into the LP feedback uh, since the completion of the investigation. Um, you mentioned uh, that you expect fundraising dynamics to build significantly from here, so maybe spend a minute on sort of the path and the timeline uh, for this acceleration. Which strategies um, do you expect to be most active contributors to the fundraising outlook for Apollo over the next 12 months? And then when you take a step back, um, are there common characteristics between LPs that are sort of satisfied with the process and the results of the invest investigation uh, versus those that sort of need more time, uh, as you said in your earlier remarks. Thanks. Okay, so I'll, I'll hit it <clears throat> up front as to the specific strategies. I'm, I'll turn to Scott and Jim to talk about um, the strategies that are active in the market and where we think we're gonna make the most progress in 2021. Um, we've done a lot of limited partner and consultant calls. That's just not just me, that's the entirety of our team. The vast majority of feedback from the LPs and consultants to date has been positive. They appreciate the seriousness and transparency and thought that we have put into this process. ESG are not just three initials to them or to us. This is something that we have to live every day. Uh, they have acknowledged that the report by Deckard substantiated what we told them. No involvement by Apollo or its employees and no wrongdoing on Leon's part. Uh, and they've commended us on the actions we've taken with respect to uh, the governance changes and the succession planning. For the vast majority of LPs, uh, that will be enough. They think we've struck the right balance. For some LPs, as I've said, they will be, want to see how these changes develop. And for some, they will wanna see these changes uh, fully implemented. I do not believe that there is a specific characteristic across limited partners who perhaps are fully satisfied versus those who are uh, less than fully satisfied at this point in time. But I will note with 455 billion of AUM and 1500 institutional investors, something is happening in, in our funding business almost every day. Uh, in the fourth quarter, a number of people uh, hit pause simply to wait to see the outcome. I believe in the first quarter we will see some of that pause simply come through, and then we will get stronger every day. As to the specific products, why don't I start with Scott, and then Scott will hand it to Jim. Sure. Um, so look, on the opportunistic side, as Mark touched on a little bit earlier, you know, we're in the market now with uh, infrastructure, with Asian real estate, with impact. Um, we, are, uh, we have raised and continue to raise additional SPACs. Would expect to see more of that. Um, we have some new product that we're working on that, that, you know, in all likelihood will be coming out in a meaningful way this year as well. Um, on the credit side, a uh, number of evergreen, a uh, number of evergreen funds that are, that are, have already, ha, you know, have been fundraising and continue to fundraise, uh, you know, large cap originations that uh, often syndicate to our LPs as well. So quite a, quite a bit of activity expected for 2021. Thank you. Our next question comes from Robert Lee with KBW. Your line is open. Sure, yeah, thanks for taking my question. And uh, Mark, quite a move from sabbatical to CEO, so I uh, hope congratulations are, are in order for you. Um, the, uh, I'm just curious, you know, there's a lot of going on in terms of, you know, investing in the business. Can you maybe update us on how you're thinking about how these initiatives uh, we should be thinking about how they will impact kind of FRE margins going forward? Um, you know, you're already, you know, pretty high investment, investment class. So, you know, where, where do you think we go from here is, I guess, my first question. Okay. Um, why don't I take that? So, uh, clearly, in hindsight, taking a, a sabbatical in the middle of a pandemic is a very bad idea. Um, first, I, I went nowhere and I did nothing. But in some sense, it actually accomplished uh, everything it was supposed to accomplish. Uh, the first half of 2020, uh, I worked like an associate, uh, new to a firm. We closed two of the largest insurance transactions in the insurance marketplace. Uh, and by the end of June, uh, I needed a little bit of a break. And when I say it accomplished what it was supposed to accomplish, with me sitting there every day, the team that is way smarter than I am, that really makes things happen in the insurance business, never got to spread their wings. We now, with six months to have passed, 
we've settled into a routine that is completely sustainable, where I am involved in those things that add value where I can add value, but where the day-to-day -day responsibility is in the hands of people who, as you will meet them in our various investor presentations, you will come to the same conclusion that I have, which is it gets better once you get past me. Um, as it relates to FRE margins, <clears throat> I'll put it in the context of more of our five-year plan. Fifteen months ago, we uh, sponsored an investor day, and believe me, we rolled out the target and we said $600 billion of AUM. Uh, I was watching the audience, a number of faces dropped, and thought that goal was unsustainable or unrealistic. Fifteen months later, we're halfway toward that target. The outcome of that target, since AUM is the fundamental driver of revenue, is mid-double-digit growth for a very long period of time. As to growth and investment in any particular year, <clears throat> it is not the revenue or the AUM that I so much focus on or that you should be focused on. The decision in every, any given year as to whether we will grow double-digit low or double-digit high will be primarily driven by the pace of investment in the front end. And we balance that very carefully. As you've heard me say already, I believe we are in a growth business. We serve people who are desperate for yield. Our institutional business is growing. Our insurance business is growing. Our retail business is growing. We need to make sure we grow the front end consistent with the AUM potential we have. $10 billion purchase of investment that year. Hopefully that answers your question. Thank you. Our next question comes from Ken Worthington with JP Morgan. Your line is After open. liquidating 8.5. Hi, good morning. Um, maybe more broadly in private equity, Apollo tends to be an, a value investor, and U.S. market valuations are elevated based on a historic perspective. Um, I know your announced pipeline looks, looks quite good, but valuations are now quite elevated. And should we expect the pace of investment to start to slow here? Um, and then maybe on a tan tangent, um, does the back market grow big enough? to maybe further drive invest, uh, further drive competition here, uh, making it even harder to uh, invest, new invest new investor dollars. Thanks. Sure. So, look, as I've said in the past, um, you know, m market indexes aren't necessarily a good indicator of uh, uh, what's going on in, across the breadth of the market. The, the um, you know, the, the pipeline at, in the PD business is, is really stronger now than it's been at any time, even through the through the crisis. Um, and so, I would expect, uh, if I had to estimate, a, a, a bigger than uh, average uh, deployment year in, in private equity this year, just based on what we're seeing and, and what we have teed up, e even in the short to medium term. So, um, I actually think uh, deployment across private equity, hybrid value, a number of our other opportunistic funds, notwithstanding the market backdrop. Uh, is still uh, is still um, incredibly strong. Um, as okay, far so as they did issue SPACs, overall uh, decent amount of debt on the Apollo fund in that year SPACs, to cover the uh, massive amount of investments that we interesting mentioned. Asset class. It is not a flash in the pan. Uh, SPACs are here to stay for uh, a lot of fundamental reasons. Um, in some respects, is it competition? Sure, but we've always had competition. Um, if anything, you know, Apollo has now proven our ability to uh, successfully issue SPACs. Uh, we, 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 we've issued a number. We have uh, several more in the pipeline. And see it as a real opportunity to add to the uh, asset category footprint that we have. And I, I think you'll continue to see that be, uh, you know, an increasing part of how we approach the market, uh, you know, across the spectrum of risk and return. All right, so now we're just going to cover the balance sheet and then we can actually analyze what we got here. Thank you. Our next question comes from Bill Cat. If you're watching and you're enjoying the content, please subscribe to the channel, like the video. As well, uh, maybe a question for, for comment your tied together your, uh, picture appreciation, side of things. critiques, Could you dimension suggestions for uh, future valuations to do, GNA or other anything like that. To the, but please, please, please subscribe. And as you think about 2021, could you dimension right, a little bit the balance sheet. Sort of see 
uh, either the comp ratio or the non-comp uh, uh, FRE drivers just given uh, Mark's commentary about growing the front end? Sure. So I think, Bill, the step up in Q4 from Q3 on non-comp was uh, uh, effectively explained or, or uh, was explained by the trust of the um, And so as we look forward, um, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's a slightly different answer for comp and non-comp. We, we are growing. Right? We've added headcount. One. So it's natural to expect that the cost of the firm uh, continue to increase. Um, on the non-comp side, um, you know, we're looking at and we're in, engaged in new premises in many uh, offices around the, the, the world, including both New York and London. That comes with a cost. Um, and so, so um, you know, we manage non-comp very carefully and tightly. Um, but, you know, as the headcount growth um, increases and the, um, the, the, the needs to support all of our employee base, Ah, we made it all the way back to 2014. It's the first time they actually list their fixed assets on their balance sheet specifically. Interesting. And that is we focus on FRE growth and we manage FRE growth relative to interesting in the platform and building out the origination side and all the support that's needed for that with the revenue growth that comes with that. It's not a straight line, but, you know, we are very... We have strong conviction in our, in our maintained FRE growth rate as we look forward from here. Granted, their fixed assets makes up a pretty piddly percentage of their actual asset base. In any one year. But still. Uh, but we manage that based on the opportunities to grow the platform. Just interesting. Uh, in view of when we think the revenue will come. Thank you. Our next question comes from Patrick Devitt with Autonomous Research. Your line is open. Hey, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm next to fundraising, the 2021 fundraising from a different angle. I, I think you said around 49, 50 billion of the gross inflow last year was what you consider organic. So as you think about all the stuff you listed that is in the market or expected to be in the market this year, what do you think is a good range for gross fundraising relative to that number, uh, excluding your view of what Athena and Thor deal volume could be? So I'm, I'm going to start and then I'm going to turn it, I guess, to uh, Martin. Um, I think it's important to understand, you know, how we come at this holistically. So there is Athene and Athora deal volume, but uh, as you know, we are in the retail market every day. This year, organic growth at just Athene, north of 20 billion. We are among the largest providers of alternative asset services in the retail marketplace. We, we elect to do that, though, in the form of guaranteed income rather than in the form of funds. We can, at a later date, explore the efficiency of that. When we start a new fundraise, no matter which fund it is, we start with a very important anchor relative to almost anyone else in the marketplace. And that anchor is our massive permanent capital. Yeah, I'll see. Only in an asset management company do you see them go from $15.1 billion in debt to $1.8 billion in debt the next year and then kind of slowly building up their debt over the course of several years and then going from $3.7 billion to $14.6 billion in another year. A lot of movement amount of assets. <laughs> Adequate alternative assets to our insurance platform is a very important part of achieving the overall returns of the insurance company. And it actually has a second benefit. It aligns us... Not just their income statement and their cash flow statements that are chaotic. Their balance sheet is pretty chaotic too in that we own, in some instances, 15 or 20 percent of a new alternative fund relative to what a GP commitment might be. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's just business as usual. Great. So just to, I'll just put some a bit more uh, color around that. We, we typically raise, away from a year when we're raising a big flagship. Partially gap accounting's fault, honestly. We typically raise somewhere between 15 and 20 billion of third-party capital. Uh, and then, in addition to that, we have organic growth with insurance platforms, plus we have uh, insurance M&A, um, and then we have further deployment of assets in our in our insurance platforms uh, as as we reposition their balance sheets. So, you know, without you know without any sort of unusually large M&A, without any flagship, uh, you're in the range of forty to fifty billion dollars a year, give or take. 
uh, and then with upside from there, uh, uh, driven by driven by the other two components. Thank you. Our next question comes from Michael Sessions with Morgan Stanley. Your line is open. Hey, good morning. Thanks for taking the question. I was just we'll go ahead and close out that call. Like I said, we're pretty much done now. Let's see what it all looks like. So, very, very strange company to look at as far as gap accounting goes. Uh, but like I said, it's nothing necessarily wrong with it. Uh, don't get too hung up on that. We have a whole lot of bunch of other stuff to input. None of the core projections are put in yet, but let's see what everything sort of looks like. Um, they're unlevered beta of 0.75 after levering up at 86.65%, which I actually thought it might be higher than that. Uh, comes out to 1.36, which gives us a cost of equity of 9.62%. Um, but again, they have a pretty significant amount of debt, which is only coming out at 3.44% um, cost of capital uh, prior to adjustments of tax. Uh, so that means we end up with a weighted average cost of capital of 3.95% after making those adjustments. The, uh, as you can see, the book value of their debt comes to 12.5 billion, including lease liabilities that actually comes down to 11.5 billion after adjusting for the market value so their their debt is actually relatively cheap for them to carry that's pretty nice um sales to capital ratio is pretty low which like i said is a pretty much what we would have expected for their for their business it's been a little bit all over the place because of the changes in their their uh, overall capital base sort of look at what the five-year average is it goes up a little bit which we'll go with the five-year average we'll probably use some long-term averages for a lot of things involved in this uh, just because like I said they have a very very chaotic set of uh, financial statements so longer term averages make a little bit more sense to use as a base which is one of the reasons that for example their current PE of 7.45 uh, is a little bit misleading to think about because that's also something that you might want to think about as a longer term average not necessarily longer term average of the actual PE at the time, but the current price divided by a more like a normalized net income would make more sense because yeah, their net income is a bit all over the place. Uh, down and up and down and up partially just because of uh, you know changes in the income. So this number right here is probably way overstating where they actually stand at the current level in any sort of sense. Uh, same can be said for tax rates, so we probably want to use longer term average for that as well. Uh, but it is probably uh, a little understated here, still on that that edge. But so we're actually going to probably just multiply it up slightly because uh, we would expect them to probably come back to that sort of level right there. I can't put in the the nine year average because we didn't actually do nine years, but I'll just go one point five onto the the tax rate there uh, and sort of doing it like I said for the base year of a net income we might do about the same thing because the 20 year percent here is probably a little overstated because of these outlandish years overall uh, using a five-year average we get to 16.34 which I think is a little bit more reasonable their long-term average for the years that we actually covered is 15.73 so 16.34 as a base I think makes a little bit more sense interest costs we can basically say the same as we saw down below their uh their book interest rate is 3.44 percent uh, which means actually none of those is probably the best thing to do we'll actually maybe just go with the listed number which is why that option is available there so i can support that number directly up uh partially because they the type of interest that they accrue is probably the type of interest where they can uh, offset putting uh paying it out depending on different things happening on or different issues issuance balances so we'll go ahead and use that 
Uh, I almost never use a different year set for revenues uh, because of the fact that we usually want to use like a base base year when using whatever revenue growth rates we have, especially for things like consumer products or things like that. But I'm actually tempted to maybe do uh, use uh, an average because of the outlandishness of their their current year their current year income and how that kind of like misrepresents exactly what's going on with the company. So I'm actually tempted to to do this in their particular case. Um, not 100% decided on that, but it just makes a little bit more sense because of the way their the revenue structure is. I mean, they have years where they can literally have negative revenue just because of the way that they recognize revenue in relation to investment income. So we'll, we'll maybe leave it there. I might change my mind as I go, but might make more sense to do that because this is also probably an outstated year. Um, Turns on invested capital. Long term average over the time frame we did was 7.95. So the fact that the three year average comes to 9.12 is, you know, it's a little bit higher than the longer term average, but I think that that's perhaps not too bad considering it's not terribly far off. Um, and it seems like some of the more recent years they did have higher realized gains. So it could be that that actually makes sense. debt to equity ratio let's actually take a look Total debt levels relative to their market cap uh, over the long term. So you see, like for example, in the trailing twelve months, it's been a higher amount of debt than their market cap uh, at, the, at the reporting date. But as it currently is, that's not the case. Uh, and then that was also the case in twenty twenty fiscal year. But then it was totally, totally different in twenty nineteen. So which is what I sort of mean that like this has definitely been a little bit all over the place. It was an extremely high level in twenty fourteen, but that's partially because of the change over investment security so that's one of the things where very difficult to say i'm actually might like look at a long-term average long-term average of uh total debt as per the years that we looked at was 7.7 .7 billion versus the long-term average of the market cap was 7.6 billion so it has roughly usually been around that 100 percent line so maybe 150 is a little bit overstating it maybe 125 uh but then 50 percent Considering most of those years was below, that might not, it might actually be too high for 50 on the best case. 25 might be a better place to put it. So 75% for the analyst number. See also capital ratios where we're really gonna punish them. Oh well, it didn't actually punish them that hard, but we also haven't put the the uh, revenue growth in at all, so that's part of the reason. Um,
just that because of the the chaoticness of their sales level it kind of makes sales to capital perhaps even be a questionable measure to use for this type of industry uh, but that is what the spreadsheet is built around so we sort of have to make some sort of estimate around it might be slightly more generous to them on the analyst case Three seven three seven sort of three seven no matter what maybe point six Revenue estimates for 2021 is 32.8% over the 2020 year, and then 11.9 after that. umbrellas will be fine with that uh, revenue distribution you can kind of see that it's like yeah they've had um, overall much higher revenue growth so maybe we'll boost it a little bit but it's, I would have to look at this very strange trend because this is kind of overstating it I think because you can see it's like we had this number here then it went down then it went up then it went up some more then it went down very very significantly then it went up then it went down again then it went up very very dramatically so you can see it's like there's a little bit of a zigzagging kind of motion with the revenue because of the the way they recognize revenue. Uh, so that's why I, I'm kind of trying to leave this number here. Uh, you could maybe argue that maybe a two year average would be a little bit better. But then at that point, I would have to maybe adjust this. Maybe 5% there. 15% on the upside.
the analyst might be projecting a little bit higher than that though. And if I was gonna do that though, I'd probably change the probability distribution. Weighted a little bit more towards the positive end. I just kind of want to leave this oddness in there because I don't know exactly how much of an outstated year this really comes out to be. Drop it to like 10% here. that so actually I might be willing to put a little bit more into the upper end just because they do have a long-term trailing average of a pretty strong amount of uh, revenue growth even during this year when it had come down from the previous year there you can see that the five-year average was still 17.71 so in fact, you could argue that maybe it should be like 20 here and instead just wait it further into the midpoint so that's the case that I don't necessarily want to put that there but like that perhaps like really really uh way to make the make the the bottom end of it a very very low amount of the probability uh really really weight things towards the mid end but leave a, a higher contingency chance might even will be willing to go so far as to put both of these at 35. do you think this is Probably between these two is not a bad spot to leave it. What does Zach say about revenue? Because of the way I weighted the distribution, it might make more sense to put that at 65. I think might be about it.
All right, we'll cover the default risk and call it a day. Okay. All right. So that everything we come up with. Yep. Okay. So uh, that's uh, APO Apollo Global Management. Investment and Asset Management Group, private equity real estate investment firm. Uh, a little bit of an odd company. Very, very difficult to kind of parse out the financial statements compared to, uh, like, just say a consumer product company, for example. Financial companies are usually very strange. This isn't like a direct financial company, but being an investment firm, it has a lot of those weirdness, those same weirdnesses, or some different weirdnesses too, but uh, either way. So um, today, the treasury is 1.45% and our equity risk premium for the mature market that we have is at 4.93. That gets us a mature market expected return of 6.375%. With the uh, risk that we have associated with Apollo, we come up with a discount rate of 9.55% uh, and they currently have a dividend of 3.65%, but it tends to vary a little bit more than a standard dividend growth. Or uh, operation five years ago they had sales of 1.9 billion uh, compared to the most recent trailing 12 months of 6.1 billion but sales itself is a little bit of a strange concept for them because of the way that they, they recognize revenue uh, revenues as a investment firm so it's a little bit confusing to look like uh, it says that they have sales growth of 25 percent each year for those five years but as i said it's a little bit weird this number is probably a little bit overstated compared to where it would be in sort of like a longer term average of growth. So this number is also probably overstated, just worth noting. Sales of capital ratio five years ago was 0.37. It's currently about 0.37. Uh, it does also tend to vary a little bit uh, in the, compared to their industrial grouping. It's a little bit low on the, compared to the four or five that is expected there. Uh, returns on invested capital of about 9.12 over the most recent few years with a debt to equity ratio of about 93 to 94%. Uh, they have an adjusted profit margin of 16.34% compared to industrial groupings of 15.97%. So they're a little bit low on the sales capital, but a little bit high on the profit margin, which uh, is perfectly aligned with the, the general trend that we see over most companies. And they have profit in the most recent year of $1.7, $1.8 billion. Uh, also a little bit of a strange number to look at in any one individual year for the same reason that the sales is. But either way, that is what it is. They're currently trading at 57.62. And uh, for the probability distribution that we are using, it's a very, very strange lopsided distribution that we're using. Uh, we're including some worst case scenarios, but both of them were weighing down uh, pretty low. And the same thing with uh, the, the higher end scenario, which I would argue is it's actually possible that we could theoretically even put it up a little bit further in that particular case. But I'm fine with where I'm putting it for a couple other reasons that I'm generous to them in some other areas. So this is the distribution we have very heavily tilted towards the fourth model. Uh, in, in between area as well as the analyst models kind of in that same time area as well uh, that gets us 
revenue uh, distribution of anywhere from $3.2 billion five years from now to possibly $10.5 billion. But again, that's maybe thinking sort of like a long-term average because of the weirdness of how they re recognize revenue. Either way, we're distributing about $6.8, $6.9 billion, which would be about 9.7% uh, growth per year uh, ba based off of a, an average of the sales, not the actual most recent year of sales. And we have a distributed sales capital ratio for them of about 0.55. This is one of the areas where I might be being a little bit generous to them uh, because they do have, in general, a pretty outsized record of excess returns. And so I do think that perhaps the sales and capital ratio that they have is understated because of the form of their business, where they do have to make large capital investments and wait quite a long time in order to see the, uh, the growth from them. And then because of the weirdness in their sales, I think it's possible to, that in most years is being understated. Uh, so I'm being a little bit generous to them in this regard, but I think there's justifiable reasons for it. Either way, we end up with a distributed return on invested capital for them five years from now, about 6.81%, which would be compressed from its current level, which means I'm uh, pretty fine with it. That's what, the way we should see things in general. And debt to equity ratio, we also see being compressed downward to six point or 66%, uh, because the 93% figure that we have is also being a little is a little bit weird to look at because their debt levels are also tend to be very chaotic due to the way they recognize revenue and shift investments around through their capital base. Overall, we have a default risk distributed for them about 1.84% because it can vary anywhere from being basically no de default risk to being a decently high default risk depending on the levels of debt they have in any given year based off of example, the issue that I was just explaining. Uh, so. But either way, it's not really a, a huge risk for them because even when they do have huge amounts of debt, it tends to be very well balanced out by the assets that they have uh, in, those in, in those particular years. But either way, our distributed adjusted profit margin for them five years from now is about 17.75%, which is a little bit higher than the most recent year. Uh, but they've also had some pretty outstanding years of profit margins for, as well as low years of profit margins. Overall on net, I'd say they in general have a little bit of a higher profit margin. So I'm okay with that number. That gets us a distributed profit for them of about $1.2 billion, which with the discount rate that we're using, uh, carried back to present value, gets us a present value share price of $55.24, which would put them about 4% over value based off of the current price. Five-year value targets forward, which are unadjusted for dividends that would be paid out, go from anywhere in the worst case scenario of them being worthless uh, in, in some of these, the worst case scenario that we talked about where essentially their asset base uh, essentially would be fleeing them uh, and their investor base would be fleeing them and so that they would end up having to liquidate most of their assets, but not in such a way that they can distribute it to shareholders. They'd be too busy distributing it to the uh, actual investors in their investor base. So that, that's why it get, gets so low in such a worst case scenario. But on the best case scenario, and, and most case scenarios, they do have a decent amount of upside uh, going all the way up to possibly $223 per share in one of the better case scenarios. So it's a lot of, uh, like I said, generosity to them in numerous ways. Uh, be the way that gets us a distributed five-year target on adjusted for dividends of $87.16 per share which based off of the current share price would give us an expectation of 8.64% per year, which uh, isn't too shabby compared to the expected return for the market as a whole, but is a little bit lower than the discount rate. So it means that it's a little bit under the expected return that you would generally require for a proper risk adjustment. So not terrible returns, not great returns, but not enough returns to cover the risks involved with the company. Short-term pricing metrics based off of multiple regression gets us a pretty high pricing level, uh, partially because of the really low uh, price to book and uh, enterprise to capital multiples that you see here, but that's actually pretty common for a lot of like financial and investment related firms. Uh, market tends to be a little bit more pessimistic on the, the potentials there, as well as some of the fundamentals, especially involving the capital base relative to sales, tends to be a little bit on the uh, low side. Either way, we don't make decisions based on that, uh, and so you shouldn't either. Uh, this is definitely the way to look at it. Uh, the expected return of 8.64% is what I would expect for them. So either way, yeah, that's uh, Apollo Global Management. I'm definitely willing to admit that there is a decent chance of misunderstanding on my part as far as this particular valuation goes, because of just like I said, it's all of the oddities involved in looking at gap accounting 
for this particular company. I mean, I'm doing a lot of adjustments before I get to my valuation here for how far getting us away from gap accounting, uh, but the, the numbers that they report is under gap accounting. So, which is, the point is, is being able to parse out all those details into an accurate reflection of valuation can be a little bit confusing. In fact, I wouldn't uh, blame people for uh, saying screw all of this uh, difficulty and instead relying on a basic dividend discount model. Uh, but I, that's a little too simplistic for me and can be uh, overstated by the management of the firm. Either way, I'm expecting 863 from them. Uh, nothing, nothing outstanding, nothing that particularly piques my interest, but it was a very interesting company to look at regardless. So that's gonna be it for today. Uh, if you're watching and if you've enjoyed this content, please, please, please subscribe to the channel. Please, please like the video. Uh, give us your comments, your criticisms, your suggestions uh, as far, far as this valuation of this type of company, as well as uh, what company maybe we'll uh, do next. We stream three times a week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday at 10.30 a.m. Eastern. And we stream on YouTube, Twitch, DLive, Facebook. Uh, follow us there any of those places as well as many other social media platforms where we release other video content throughout the week. Uh, and yeah, have a good day. Catch you all next time.